I opened up my YouTube feed today to see the internet abuzz with what appeared to be a very big fight between Sargon of Akkad and Thunderfoot. And I thought this was a good enough opportunity as any to really stick my two cents and talk about how discourse is developing on the internet. I'm sure everyone here is expecting that I'm going to give a rundown of the fight and why I think one side was right or one side was in the wrong. But I think I'm going to take a different perspective this time. I want to ask my audiences one question that might seem a little bit strange, but I promise I'll link it back to the subject at hand by the end of the video. And the question I want to ask is this, what is the first viral video you ever remember receiving via some form of social media, be it email or Facebook or Twitter? What's the first video you ever remember having sent to you or, or forwarded with some advice to watch it because it's really interesting? I think this question will be very difficult for most of my younger viewers or anyone who's much younger than me for that matter. But I think that for my older viewers, they'll have some memory in mind because I remember very distinctly what was the first viral video I ever came across. Not the first video I remember downloading, not the first video I remember interacting with online, but the first one that was forwarded to me by somebody else on the internet via email saying, you really had to watch this. It's something that I remember very distinctly. He's either the funniest smart guy on TV or the smartest funny man. We'll find out which in a minute. But he's certainly an Emmy Award winner, the host of Comedy Central's Daily Show, and the co-author of the new mega bestseller, America the Book, A Citizen's Guide to Inaction. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Crossfire, John Stewart. Thank you. Thank you, Thank you very much. The first viral video I remember receiving was Jon Stewart's 2004 appearance on CNN's Crossfire. Now, this was the viral video that really set off Jon Stewart in The Daily Show as being something more than just political comedy, and it was a turning point in American political media history. But the more I look back on this, the more I see it as a turning point in how people have constructed their discourse and the rules that have governed how we communicate with each other, what we expect from each other, and how people try to shift the debate. I think this clip was remembered very fondly by people, especially progressives, as being a moment where truth was spoken against power. But now that I look back on it, a lot of the problems we're having that we see throughout YouTube, and even that we see in the fight between Sargon of Akkad and Thunderfoot over where civility ends and comedy begins, can be traced back to this original video. And I think by understanding what really happened, we can get more insight into what should be governing our discourse online. Now, of course, most people who watch this channel regularly will not be surprised that I think that we need a little bit of background at this stage to contextualize the video that I'm about to discuss. A lot of people who are younger than me or younger than basically any kind of older millennial might not remember the specific political situation around the election of 2004 and really what led up to it. Moreover, even to understand the event and the soundbite that occurred when Jon Stewart went on to confront the hosts of Crossfire, a broader history of how media in America worked is also needed. I really think the place to start is with one man in a very specific era, and that one man is Walter Cronkite. Now, Walter Cronkite was the anchor for the CBS Evening News. After World War II in the post-war era, from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s, this was the face of the news. This was the person who read you the truth about what was going on in the world, and most people accepted it. Walter Cronkite, in particular, was known to be the most trusted man in America. He was the person that delivered what these people needed to know in an unbiased fashion, or at least that's what most people believed. And indeed, in many ways, they had good reason to believe that. For the most part, during these times, in the middle part of the 20th century, news networks and television news networks ran most of their news programs and news updates basically at a loss. They considered this to be a public service, a duty to the nation, 
And the fact that these companies had a virtual monopoly allowed them to do this without really questioning what it did to their overall profit lines. Therefore, they could hire relative centrists like Walter Cronkite to basically deliver the news in a fashion that would be unoffensive to most middle Americans and communicate the broad consensus in politics. And indeed, there was a broad consensus in politics. This was the famous post-war consensus. And really until the late 60s, and even continuing on through the 70s, this was the reigning ideology that most middle Americans had. And seeing that perspective represented in the evening news was more or less expected. And Walter Cronkite delivered that. So what changed? Well, eventually networks moved from a model where news would essentially be run into loss to where news programs had to compete with other programming for ratings at prime time. This process eventually led news to take a more sensationalist tact. And you saw a lot of the older, more plodding, more paced tones of Cronkite supplanted by louder voices, more action-oriented news, sensationalism to a certain degree. And this was only accelerated by the advent of cable, until you got things like CNN, Fox News, and a variety of other networks that were able to essentially run news as entertainment and have a 24-hour news cycle. Now, I think a lot of people on the left originally greeted the departure from the post-war consensus and the more pedestrian approach to the news with some amount of enthusiasm. This was a change. They wanted something that was more radical, more out there, more challenging. But as the 90s wore on and you got shows like Crossfire and Bill O'Reilly and other things that really indicated not so much a challenging or a radicalization of the news, but rather a popularization and a turn towards entertainment-based news. A lot of thinkers, especially on the left, really saw this turn of events as being detrimental to American society, and there grew an increasing animosity towards this. And indeed, I think this initial animosity really kicked off the fake news parody. The skit was originally done on Saturday Night Live with much success with Norm MacDonald, and it eventually transferred to The Daily Show, a program that Comedy Central started in some ways to parody cable news and in other ways to create just a platform for reviewing the news with a comedic tilt. But Jon Stewart stood out from the rest of the parody news shows because of his particular interest in American political discourse. And inside this interest, he held up the entertainment-based cable news programs, and in particular, the entertainment-based debate programs like Crossfire, for particular contempt. And this contempt came to the fore when he was invited on Crossfire to discuss politics in the wake of the 2004 presidential election, shortly after the invasion of the Iraq War. Now, going into the Crossfire interview with Jon Stewart, I think everyone was expecting some kind of confrontation. But what actually happened was a very surreal moment in American television. And I think if we watch it, we can really understand how our era of public discourse, both in the media and online, really came from the previous eras of public discourse, where things were more formatted. And we can see a lot of the same flaws we're dealing with right now emerge from this one video clip. But before I get ahead of myself, let's take a look at the actual interview. Um, why, why do you argue? <laughs> the two of you, I, I hate to see it. We enjoy it. Let me ask you a question. Wait, let me ask you a question first. All right. Is John Kerry, is John Kerry really the best? I mean, I think, you know, John Kerry's not a terrible the best? guy. Like, he, no, no, is I he thought the, Lincoln was good. Is he the best the Democrats can do? So already in this clip, we can see that things are not going normally. John Stewart's a guest. Usually people who are comedians and guests are smiling and happy. Stewart looks like he's going to an execution. And in the meantime, as opposed to the hosts asking the guests, they basically have a very strange personal question asked to them by the guests. And indeed, Stewart does have a particular place he's taking this conversation. I think oftentimes the person that knows they can't win is allowed to speak the most freely. And uh, uh, because otherwise shows with titles such as Crossfire, Crossfire, or Hardball, or I'm gonna kick your ass, or uh, <laughs> we'll 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 jump on it. it. And indeed, at this point, we can see John Stewart's critique coming into focus. There's a problem with soundbite culture, and true enough, cable networks thrived on soundbite culture. They'd excerpt some small clip of politicians saying something and take them to task for it, regardless of the content. 
And that's not to say that earlier eras like Walter Cronkite did not also suffer from the problem that out of context lines could be used to the detriment of politicians dishonestly. But at the same time, there's a mediating force there. And in the era of cable news, it seemed like everything people were getting was spin. I made a special effort to come on the show today because I have uh, privately amongst my friends and also in occasional newspapers and television shows <laughs> mentioned uh, this show as being uh, uh, bad. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and, and I wanted to, I felt that that wasn't fair and I should come here and, and tell you that I don't, it's not so much that it's bad as it's hurting America. <laughs> so I, I wanted to but come here today let me, and say, wait, wait, no, I just, no, let me, here, here, here's just one, what I wanted to tell you guys. Yeah. Stop. <laughs> stop, stop, stop. Stop hurting America. Okay, now. Let me, and and let come work you. for us because we, as the people. How do you pay? The people, not, not well. Better than CNN, I'm sure. But you can sleep at night. And so the plot thickens. Now, for people who are too young to remember the political environment in 2004, this was just what progressive and moderate progressive America was looking for. They were looking for an explanation as to why the media essentially allowed Bush to start a war in Iraq with very flimsy pretexts. And the explanation that it was a dumbed-down culture in the media seemed to be incredibly palatable. And they were waiting for a moment where someone would stand up and confront them, and Jon Stewart was giving it to them. The media was hurting America. It was dumbing down our discourse. It wasn't being the guardian that Walter Cronkite was in the era of the post-war consensus. And that's the reason why these bad policies were being enacted by Bush and everybody else who moderate progressive people didn't like in the early 2000s. And Jon Stewart played right into this. See, the, the, the thing is, we need your, your help. You're, right now, you're helping the politicians and the, 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 the corporations, and we're left out we're there like to mow our lawns. You just said we're too rough on them when they make mistakes. No, 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 you're not too rough on them. You're part of their strategies. You're partisan, um, what do you call it? Hacks. Wait, John, wait. And so the gauntlet is laid down. Like, let, me, so, let me tell you something valuable that I think we do that I'd like to see you something do. Something valuable? You do. Yeah, no. Well, yeah. It's, it's I nice would like when, to, I would when like politicians, to when, I, I'll tell you, I want to contrast our questions with some questions you asked John Kerry. If, if, you wanna, if you want to compare your show to a comedy show, you're more than no, welcome no, to. And so begins the great dodge. But let's watch a little bit further because Tucker Carlson does have a good point. Yeah. Kerry won't come on this show. He will come on your show. Let me suggest right. why he wants to. Well, we have show. civilized discourse. Well, here are three of the questions you asked, John. Yeah. You have a chance to interview the Democratic nominee. You asked him mm -hmm. questions such as, quote, how are you holding up? Is it hard not to take the attacks personally? Yeah. Have you ever flip-flopped, et cetera, et cetera? Yeah. Didn't you feel like you got the chance to interview the guy? Why not ask him a real question instead of just suck up to him? Now, I can obviously see where Tucker Carlson is coming from in this clip. It's one thing for the pot to call the kettle black. But I really think that he misread the political disposition of the American population at this point, who really was looking for some kind of quality and honesty from the media, which it didn't feel like it was getting. And this made Jon Stewart's answer, really his only answer to this question, very, very easy. You know, it's it's interesting to hear you talk about I felt my responsibility you. to the, you know, I, I didn't realize that, and maybe this explains quite a bit, no, the opportunity is that the news organizations look to Comedy Central for their cues on integrity. So, <laughs> right. um, no, no. if your idea of uh, confronting me is that I don't ask hard-hitting enough news questions, we're in bad shape, fellas. We're here. And that's what a lot of Americans were looking for in 2004. Someone who would admit to the low quality and, frankly, the dishonesty of the mainstream media. No, no, but, but what well, I'm saying is, is this. I, I'm not. I'm here to, to confront you because we need help from the media and they're hurting us. I think it's a little too easy to look at Jon Stewart's you're hurting us, like the typical progressive condescension. But I think this makes more sense when you look at it in the light of Walter Cronkite, when you did have news anchors really express the American consensus, and there was an American consensus. People wistful for that age might indeed look at the advent of entertainment news as being a betrayal of that. And the fact that it took a comedian to point this out would be all the more ironic. The indictment is, and I have seen you say this, that yeah. uh, crossfire reduces everything, as I said in the intro, to right. left, right, black, white. Yes. Well, it's because, see, we're a debate show. It's like seeing the no, Weather no, Channel. No, 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 that'd be great. A storm I would love to see a debate show. To do a debate hours. would be great, but that's like saying pro wrestling 
is uh, a show John. about athletic John. I'm competition. Sorry. I, I now, here Stewart's obviously hearkening back to actually good debate shows, like William F. Buckley's Firing Line. But these were a product of a much different age. Like I said, they were a product of a very much less divided America. And rewatching it now, it's questionable if Jon Stewart even really wants that. And I think in many ways, he does answer it by his next comment. Now, this is theater. I mean, it's, it's it obvious. Is, no, no, it How old are you? 35. And you wear a bow tie. Yeah, I do. I do. So, I do. so this is. No, no, I know, I know. So You're right. Let me just go. John Stewart certainly isn't above a low blow. <laughs> that this you're doing theater when you should be doing debate, which would be great. Well, you do no, so it's, just it's not, not honest. And what you do is not element, honest. Course, what you do is partisan honest. hackery. And I'll, and I'll tell you, you why I, I know You on your show, and you sniff his throne, and you're accusing us of partisan hackery? Absolutely. You're You've a, got to be kidding, man. You're on CNN. And you say. My, the show that leads into me is puppets making crank phone calls. <laughs> what is wrong with you? Well, I'm just and this indictment really brought down the house. Everybody could see through the transparency and the crassness of the kind of lowbrow debate show Crossfire was. And indeed, Jon Stewart could be isolated from any criticism. He was a comedian, and he was just ironically speaking truth to power. But of course, the capstone to this came when Tucker Carlson made the very ill-advised decision to insult his audience's intelligence and try to imply that Jon Stewart just wasn't doing comedy well enough. Have so, is, okay, you have a responsibility to the public discourse, and you, you fail need to get a job at a miserably. School, I think you need to go to one. The, the thing that I want to say is, when you have people on for just knee-jerk reactionary talk. Wait, I thought you were going to be funny. Come on, be no, funny. No, no, I'm not going to be your monkey. And with that line, John Stewart ended Crossfire, and in many ways changed media forever. All right, all right, so where does this finally leave us? Why am I bringing up this more than decade-old clip from CNN in an attempt to explain what's going on in our modern YouTube era and to explain fights between modern YouTubers? Well, in this moment, Jon Stewart really pioneered a new type of political discourse, the discourse of pure criticism. Now, because Jon Stewart was a comedian, he could avoid any kind of calls for standards. He was somebody who stood outside anybody's ability to point and say, well, why aren't you doing any better? Why aren't you raising the bar? And as such, he could stand outside any kind of control and simply point the finger at his ideological opponents, demand that they provide higher quality, demand that they do something to bring back the era of Walter Cronkite, to bring back the era when we all agreed and spoke civilly. And that's a great position to be in, because pointing the finger and saying, you suck is pretty much the easiest possible thing you can do. You don't have to answer any of the hard questions. And indeed, Jon Stewart didn't have any answers to these hard questions. For every bit about not having hard questions, controversies explored in nuance, and actual debates that serviced the public's understanding, Jon Stewart never once facilitated the kind of discourse that he criticized Crossfire for not providing. Jon Stewart, more than any other figure in America, has created our current media environment when it comes to discussing political events. He's the person that's brought forward this fake newscast, not as just a spin-off from a Saturday Night Live or other parody comedic channel, but something that's in its own right a form of media communication. He's the one that's created the Samantha Bees and the Trevor Noahs of the world. But in this new media environment, are we in a golden age of debate, of honest discourse, of trust? Did we go back to the era of Walter Cronkite? Of course we didn't. Every single aspect that Jon Stewart criticized in Crossfire is now more exacerbated, is now more on display in every piece of media that we consume. And that's because Jon Stewart didn't actually have to provide any answers to the question, since he could shift himself into a mode of pure criticism. And sure enough, comedy should be done in a mode of pure criticism. And before Jon Stewart, there are plenty of political comedians for hundreds of years. It was a long tradition. But political comedians didn't get to use their position to come onto the shows of serious commentators, even if they were very, very banal commentators, and deride them for their lack of journalistic responsibility. The fact that this could happen, and that Jon Stewart could go forward and be actually respected as one of the premier political thinkers of the time, said the message to the culture that all that was really needed was criticism. 
that no positive solution needed to be put forward, that we could essentially exist in a mode where a thinker could be a disembodied critic of the culture that surrounded him, even without following any ideology or living up to any standards themselves. In many ways, it was this attitude that gave way to the new atheists, who if anything embodied an attitude that philosophy could be emptied of all positive elements, and indeed a lifestyle, and perhaps even a civilizational culture, could be created just around the basis of criticism. But of course, purely negative ideologies can do none of that. They are vehicles for criticism and nothing more. And despite the fact that Jon Stewart could lay down as much umbrage as he wanted to on the somewhat deserved hosts of Crossfire, he was still incapable of bringing back the Walter Cronkites and the Edward R. Murrows of the previous generation. In fact, in the era of Samantha B. and Trevor Noah, you could argue that his influence did quite the opposite, and further degraded political discourse in the country. And that is why, for all the banality and stupidity of entertainment debate shows like Crossfire, Jon Stewart's confrontation with the hosts of Crossfire hurt America. So now viewers who have been very patient in watching me analyze a more than decade old video clip might be wondering how this relates to the current fight between Sargon of Akkad and Thunderfoot on YouTube. The fight between Sargon of Akkad and Thunderfoot revolved around one live stream that Sargon of Akkad did in the wake of a YouTuber's death. A lot of jokes were made and indeed the death did occur under semi-ironic conditions. But this nonetheless was regarded by Thunderfoot as being a faux pas, being untowards, being perhaps unethical. And Thunderfoot went out of his way to criticize Sargon, in many ways very dishonestly, misquoting him as far as I can tell. And as Sargon pointed out this misquote, Thunderfoot responded with, You have a responsibility, you're a larger channel. To which Sargon replied, in so many words, No I don't, I was just doing comedy. And there the problem is laid bare. Both Sargon and Thunderfoot want to occupy the position of pure criticism, being able to demand that the other person live up to standards. Standards that somehow pertain to their prominence or the fact that they're being serious journalists and not just shitposting or doing random comedy, which would perhaps absolve them from actually following journalistic ethics. Now, in many ways, I understand the position of Sargon of Akkad. I mean, of course, everybody on the modern internet shitposts, and to a large degree, this sort of irreverent humor is how Sargon built such a large following to begin with. But this entire interaction just re-underlines the sense problem in media today, which is, if no one is actually taking themselves seriously, and everyone's trying to be the critic, if everyone's trying to be Jon Stewart coming on Crossfire, does that actually lead to more civilized dialogue? In some sense, it completely disincentivizes it. It just encourages people to find reasons why they're the person who's outside of criticism, for whatever reason. Either their channel is too small, or they're being funny, or they're just not part of the mainstream. The excuses abound, but at the end of the day, there is nobody sitting there saying, I think that we should actually take things more seriously and provide a discourse with more candor. And I get it, it's not really possible to create a popular YouTube channel without appealing to one side or the other in the culture war, and using that appeal to springboard off something that's humorous, irreverent, and highly critical of your opponents. Walter Cronkite and William F. Buckley's Fireline and Edgar R. Murrow might have been respectable, but they were boring. And they just would not play on YouTube, despite the fact that their dialogue was very, very erudite. American culture does not exist with the kind of consensus that we had in the 1950s and 60s. And the internet certainly doesn't have any kind of consensus that would support that. But does that mean that we'll be forever deprived of having any kind of enlightening conversation? I know Sargon understands that he has the ability and the calling to really pursue something that is higher. But I can see that in many ways he's torn between that calling to be a more rational voice on the internet and the general fun and financial reward that comes from being just a culture war gadfly, constantly making mid-spirited jokes about their opponents. I suppose I can't ask someone to swim hard against the currents of the age, but at some level I wish we could find a place on the internet, some isolated zone, where the likes of William F. Buckley's firing line and Edward R. Murrow's deep interviews might not seem too separated from the problems of our own age.